Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Subuni. Take the works of Botticelli, Tintorento, Caravaggio, at the artistic creation of Rome, Florence, and Venice, at Niccolo Machiavelli, Federico Fellini, and others. You have just a portion of Italy's treasures across the century. Most of the world today is an Italian loan from Pars Romana to the way their legal systems function across the world today. Most of us have borrowed from Italy. From a terrorism to the current migrant crisis in Europe, where does Italy stand on some of the key issues affecting our world today? My guest, Italian Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mario Giro, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you. Let's start with the Italian reaction after yesterday's announcement by uh, Belgian Prime Minister uh, Michel Schall and President Francois Hollande of France that Europe's most wanted man, Salah Abdeslam, has been captured. What is the reaction of Italy? It was some months that we, are, we were waiting for this announcement, of course. The first thing is that satisfaction, but you have to know that uh, Italy, since two years, is insisting in having more cooperation at the judiciary and intelligence level. We, we are facing a global challenge. It's a global challenge of terrorism. We have, we need to have uh, a, a real global uh, response, and the response is only common. You are talking about terrorism there, and. Last year, Global Terrorism Index, which is a think tank based in the United States of America, concluded that plus 18,000 people died because of terrorism, and most of them were killed by Boko Haram, were killed by Al-Qaeda, were killed by um, uh, the Islamic State. Where does Italy stand on this issue of terrorism? Italy has a long experience with terrorists because Italy in the 80s had a national internal terrorism. We know what it is about. And then uh, the first thing is uh, to speak to the population and to uh, work for the cohesion of the population. The society has to be really uh, uni united and unified uh, against this challenge. On the other side, the only thing is cooperate. Cooperate and cooperate in intelligence and security. No state, no country can face the global challenge of terrorism alone. What is Italy doing in reality, concretely, to combat international terrorism? Italy is, uh, has a long run of uh, experience and concrete experience in terrorism, uh, sustaining some countries, consider all the peacekeeping blue helmets of Italian, uh, it, uh, Italian blue helmets in Lebanon and in other countries. Uh, we have to, uh, to use the diplomacy to stop the war because war produces terrorism. Let's speak about Syria and Libya. And Italy is, uh, has a long uh, experience in uh, intelligence facing terrorism because she's, uh, it's a country exposed. We are, we are the country more near, the nearest country to the Middle East and uh, Europe and, uh, and Northern Africa. Consider that. Mr. Minister, each time we hear of terrorism in the world, or especially in Europe, you can talk of the November attacks in Paris, yeah. you can talk about July 7, 7, 2005 in London, you can talk about the Madrid attacks, which of course led to the introduction of a new government in, in, in Spain. Yeah. But each time we hear about terrorism attacks, we only hear statements from London, from Paris, from Washington. It seems to me that the Italian voice is, is drowned in this business when uh, Berlin and others have spoken. Normally, you have the notice in the news about the terrorist attack, but no, when the terrorist attacks fail. The intelligence work is silent work. Consider that. And, uh, it's also to be, it's not only a military response, it's also a political response that we need together. You were just talking a while ago that um, uh, we need to stop wars and yeah. 
It is because of wars in Syria, because of wars in Libya, because of wars in Afghanistan that we have at present an influx of, of migrants coming from those countries into, into Europe. And Italy is at the forefront of all this battle. I've seen Prime Minister Matteo Renzi moving from left to right to build an international coalition. Uh, do you think the European response to migration is adequate from no. an Italian perspective? No, not adequate for the moment. We consider that uh, the influx of migrants and refugees, we are speaking mainly about refugees in that particular context, consider the Syrians or people coming from Libya, etc., through Libya, that they are uh, fleeing the wars, uh, the, the response has to be common. And for the moment, the response is not adequate because some countries of Europe are considering that it's better to build walls, but we know that walls are built only to be destroyed. And then uh, we think that we have to be more generous and more intelligent because this is not a question of generosity, it's a question of security. Uh, and the security is really uh, uh, strong only if we are together. You just spoke a while ago that the response has to be comprehensive, has to be coherent. Mm -hmm. A few days ago, you had the government of Macedonia, which of course blocked the entry of these migrants. Yeah. About 14,000 of them were stranded in a day. And since last year, according to the International Organization for Migration, plus one million people have been struggling to enter into the European Union, the, the European yeah. space. What concretely should be done to, to have a comprehensive European ap approach because solidarity is more working. or less yes but more or less you have to consider that the crisis of uh, current refugee crisis is considering two two million people it's impossible to uh, do something for two million people in a continent of five hundred people a million people it's not so difficult well, Mr. Minister, you have to take into account that there are some European countries which equally need this population. If you take a country like Germany, where the aging population is more than the young people who also can in work, Italy. Uh, also in Italy, also then in, we other, need. Uh, in <laughs> other European people. So at the end of the day, when you complain that you are not going to take the migrants and you take them, people will say that this is not solidarity, this is hypocrisy, because in reality, you need these guys. Exactly. But you, but you are speaking about migrants. Yeah, but why the complaint? Now, first of all, we have to speak about refugees, people that are compelled to let their countries because of the war. Okay, this is one big question that we have now. Then we have migrants. That is an older and future question. And uh, I agree with you. There is nothing to complain. Let's talk about an economic model for mm. the world because if we are having people moving from Africa, if we are having people moving from Asia, if we are having people moving from, from the Middle East, it's equally because they are searching for an economic model for opportunities. Do you think that Italy has a model to sell to other parts of the world to keep these young people there? First of all, people is moving because globalization means movement. Second, people is moving also into the continents. The majority in Afri Africans are moving into Africa. This is also something that uh, the European has to understand. Third, to, to answer your question, I think that nobody has the real uh, magic uh, m uh, economical uh, model. In Italy, we have our model that is built on uh, little and medium enterprises. It's a kind of model not, uh, uh, that is working in Italy, look, but look, you, it's difficult look, to, re look, look, to Mr. replicate. Mr. This is, this is Europe's uh, Eurozone third largest economy and the eighth largest economy in the world. And mm. in 2013, you exported goods worth some 474 billion uh, uh, dollars. Yeah. Um, this is a country probably with quality products and people may need to tap from this Italian model, which of course has been yeah. good throughout the centuries. What is wrong with it today? No, it's not wrong with it. Uh, that is that also the model is linked to, to the, the tradition and the history. Mm -hmm. It's not simple to replicate it. Mm -hmm. Then we have to cooperate better with the uh, equal part uh, partnership. That is, uh, I think, my approach in cooperation. Cooperation means, of course, aid, but also private sector and also culture. You have to put the three, the three things together. 
probably the last issue of our discussion has to do with cooperation, which you just talked about. Uh, uh, we are here talking, your president is just beside us somewhere here uh, where we are seated. And he has come with a new package for Africa, for yeah. Cameroon. I can remember that in the days of uh, Mario Monti, he said, quote, we are underrepresented in the region, end of quote, and the region he was referring here was the region of Africa. Now you said that you want to hold Italian Africa Summit by mm. the month of May. Is it the comeback of Italy to Africa? In, so, in, a, in a certain sense, yes. It particularly is a new start, a fresh start of Italian cooperation. But we have also to, co to collect w all what we do, because there is also a lot of Italy abroad, mm. and uh, we have to create a comprehensive model mm. in which private sector and public aid mm. is linked together. Mm -hmm. This is crucial in my opinion. Okay. This is crucial. But you know that you are coming in to occupy a space in the market where the Chinese I already have an economic interest worth some $206 billion yearly. The Americans about $86 billion. The, the, the Japanese are, are providing some $30 billion. Yeah, yeah. Will you have enough space to overcome these big giants who have already occupied the territory? Our bet is on quality. And everybody knows what is Italian quality in doing things. Mr. Minister, let me take some few questions which have to do with restructuring your country's economic difficulties. You are just coming from a terrible period under the Baliskuni administration with the, with, the, with, the, with the 2008 economic quagmire. Is the Italian economy in a better shape today? I think yes, after the difficult years of uh, after Berlusconi Mario Monti government. I was there also. Uh, and then we have Ricoletta. Now we are relaunching everything. We re rediscovered the... the we, we are growing. The gr uh, we are growing now a little bit. Not enough, but uh, this is not a reason to wait. If you want to grow, you, you have to invest. And this is a form of, of invest, investment. What attracts you in Africa in particular now that you want to hold an African-Italian summit? We already have U.S. Africa. We the are European more... European Union Africa. There should be some yes. clash here. And the French may complain that you want yeah. to compete with them because you have Franco-Africa no. summit. I don't, I don't think that the French are, com uh, are complaining. I think that uh, w w the European countries has have to be together. Here the French has, are very present, important, historically important of their presence. We can do our part. Mm -hmm. Our ministerial meeting, it's a ministerial conference, is a way to, to hear also, to listen to our African partners and to understand well what they want and what we can propose to them. What are you proposing to a country like Cam Cameroon in particular, where you have found a series of cooperation agreements uh, were signed in the domain of education, in the domain of, 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 Crucial. of, of, of infrastructure and social? Portion. What in particular, concretely, are you offering? There are a lot of things, but I think that crucial is education, to have also higher education, because you need higher education, we need higher education. We need both education uh, of quality education of quality and uh, and then also the the system of the model of uh, little and medium enterprises mm. in agro industry that is very important mm. there is one sector which is going to employ so many people and we end from here what is Italy's contribution specifically in the domain of tourism and cultural preservation because are, I know that yes. you have a long history of, 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 of museum protection, especially yeah, of the course. Colosseum. How, how are you it's going a good to example. in all of this? It's a good example. Of course, it's a good example of a, a possible field of cooperation. Okay. Mr. Minister, let us end the interview, and I go back from where we started, terrorism. Since 2001, there has been an avalanche of terrorism after the 9-11 attacks mm. in the United States of America. We have had so many of them, Boko Haram, and many others are giving people sleepless nights across countries, across the world. So many strategies have been proposed. According to Italy, which is the best way of dealing with 21st century terrorism? The best way uh, to, to maintain uh, <coughs> a lucid and uh, quiet uh, attitude. We have no to get mad. 
the terrorist wants us to get mad together and all together. No, we have to remain calm, quiet, to strategize, to end wars, because wars are the most important thing to, for, for terrorism, because they, the wars are producing terrorists of every kind, and uh, use dialogue and diplomacy. We don't think, we have the experience of a lot of war with no results, and worse than that, well, with the production. Well, with mafia over the years, organized crime. That's another, another, another side of the story. Mm. I'm, I'm speaking about the wars in the Middle East. Mm. You know, putting one war after the other, res the result is now this confusion uh, and this crisis. And the four more sta failed states, mm. we have four more failed states, we don't live very well with four more s s Which failed are those states. states? I Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen. Mm. It's a problem. Okay. We are trying to save Iraq. We are trying to rebuild complete the uh, Syria that is completely destroyed. We are facing the Libyan crisis and trying to have a diplomatic and political agreement. And there is also Yemen, imagine. And then on the other side, there is also all the intelligence and experience that we have against the mafias. That's also gave us a lot of experience and also national terrorists. Thank you. The Italian Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mario Giro, thanks very much indeed for being Thank a guest you. on Global Thank Watch. Thank you, Charles. You are welcome. Thank you. The Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, welcome to Global Watch. Thank you. What do you make of the Cameroonian economy, especially with budgetary chaos estimated at some 3,811 billion CF francs? You know, I would observe that the Cameroon economy is facing a double shock. A security shock, which has humanitarian aspects, but also fiscal consequences, first. And second, a very brutal and probably, unfortunately, sustainable oil shock because of the much lower prices, which have declined by about 70% in the last 18 months. And in spite of those circumstances, because Cameroon has a diversified portfolio of exports and he's a, is a quite resilient economy. Uh, the Cameroon economy has been able to deliver 6%, or nearly 6% growth in 2015, and we forecast it to grow again at close to 6% in 2016. So it's not bad at all compared with uh, the sub-region average growth, which is around 2.5%. For some years now, Cameroon has embarked on the program budget, and in the middle of that budget, the government introduced a special program of roughly 925 billion CFA francs. Do you think that we are on the right track of the program budget? Our recommendation to Cameroon as well as to other countries of the uh, sub-region is to certainly continue to spend on projects but to do so in a much more selective way than it did in the past. When you have less resources, you are much more picky about which project you're going to invest those scarce resources into. So that's recommendation num number one. Number two, you have to look at alternative sources of financing. Not everything can be financed on budgetary uh, funding. Alternative sources have to be looked at uh, by way of uh, uh, reasonable borrowing at concessional terms, preferably, uh, by way of syndicated loans that are also at good, decent terms, by way of participation of the private sector, which has to be called upon in order to participate in the equipment uh, of the country. So I think that's where Cameroon is at the moment. It has to continue to invest. It has some means to do it but not as much as it did in the past. So it has to be more selective, and uh, it has to really select those projects on the basis of the added value for the economy and the multiplying effect that it will have. We are facing a severe security threat from Boko Haram, yeah. at least falling oil prices. And this nation has embarked on the 2035 vision. Is it realistic under the current economic circumstances? You know, it's very difficult to predict what will happen in 2035. But equally, it's very important to have a goal and an ambition. 
So to set a goal high and to try to reach it is commendable. What will happen to the price of oil? The forecast is probably not particularly bright for the near future or for the medium term. But the terms of the economic exchanges in the coming 20 years, I cannot predict. Nobody can predict. But you can set high goals. Uh, probably our last question. The CEMAC zone growth rate uh, fell from about 4% to about 22 And uh, there are some rumors that some countries want to leave the, C the CFA franc. Mm -hmm. Are we heading towards an economic disintegration? I would certainly hope not. Uh, I think the, uh, the monetary zone has been extremely helpful to keep price stability. If you have an inflation which is at around 2.5% at the moment in the sub-region, it's actually really beneficial, particularly for the people that are most in need. High inflation, price instability, uh, a monetary policy that is at odd with uh, the rest of the zone would certainly not help in the context of those big exogenous shocks that are uh, hurting uh, the zone at the moment. Two is bad enough. You don't want to add a third one. Mrs. Lagarde, uh, how would you like to be remembered when you are leaving the IMF, finally? I'm not about to leave the IMF, <laughs> finally. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Christine Lagarde, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Thank you very much Thank for being us on Globe Watch. Lord Sebastian Kuh, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much. Nice to be here again. Uh, let me start with your personal connection with athletics. Are you a happy president of IAAF today? I'm a happy president because I'm serving a sport that I love that I'm passionate about and that has given me everything that I enjoy in life. You, you just said that you are happy. So the unending scandals involving doping do not scare you. They are challenges, but they're not the only challenges in our sport. Uh, and of course, they're not the only challenges in athletics. Uh, global doping has been a problem for many years. It manifests itself in many, many different ways, as we've seen this week in tennis. So my responsibility is not to benchmark our sport, our great sport of athletics against other sports. It's to put changes in place that will return trust to the IAAF and trust to our you, 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 athletes. I, I've seen you across media organizations today, and you have repeatedly used the word restoration of trust. We'll be coming there in a moment. But just describe to me, how do you qualify the current doping scandals? Uh, they are a problem, but they're not the only problems that our sport confronts. You know, we have to remember that the biggest challenge athletics faces is getting more young people into our sport. Doping has to be resolved. We're never going to entirely resolve it because that's human nature. A few people will always step outside of the norms and the boundaries. But my responsibility as the president of the IAAF is always to make sure our member federations, my own organization, have systems that are robust and secure and that the clean athletes can trust in. Oh, well, well, let me just give you a quotation of your standing orders, or if you like, your constitution. Quote, eradicating doping from sport and safeguarding the authenticity and identity of athletics remains a crucial part of your business. You know what happened with the Russian Athletics Federation? Yes. Why did you guys fail in your mission? Uh, no, the issue is a very simple one. We need to put those, those uh, systems in place that make sure but, you know, this isn't a single country problem. This is about having systems that are safe and secure and making sure that the council, my council, is always in a position to challenge me, to challenge those systems, and have as much information as they possibly can. And that is exactly what I'm doing now.